If you're going to watch Oregon and Michigan this week, you got to know about the game. And you're going to know everything you need to know right here on today's show. You are Locked On College Crossover, part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. Yes, it's that time once again for a Locked On College crossover episode of Locked On Ducks. I'm Spencer McLaughlin. That's Isaiah Hull of Locked On Wolverines. Thanks for making this your first listen or your first view of the day part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. This episode brought to you by our friends over at Game Time because Game Time is the best. Download the Game Time app, create an account, use code Locked On College for $20 off your first purchase. We will put each other metaphorically on the witness stand and ask all the crucial questions so that you all leave this episode informed about the showdown in the big house. It's been a long time. I will be nice to Michigan fans here and not bring up what happened the last time Oregon went into uh, the big house. But I, I think Isaiah, everything leans towards Oregon. It's hard to pick against Oregon or think that they you know, could have a, a push from Michigan here because the offense has been cooking. The defense has been really good. The special teams have just been a non-disaster, which is usually what you just need from special teams when the offense and defense are playing as well as they have been. But there are still NFL players on on this Michigan team. I I still think about the Wolverines as, yeah, a passing challenge team, but one that can also disrupt your offensive game plan because Mason Graham and Kenneth Grant are, last time I checked, really good and are going to play on Sunday. And Will Johnson is a guy that, yeah, he's going to play on Sundays as well. And Oregon's got their fair share of NFL players. But what what should people think about with, with Michigan as to why they have a chance to hang around with Oregon in this spot with as well as Oregon's been playing the last few weeks? Well, first of all, I've got to invoke uh, a quote that comes to mind from the uh, the show The League from a good 10, 15 good years show. ago. Good yeah. show. About when Taco uh, was playing Kevin in the, the Shiva Bowl. And Taco says, you know what? If you win, I'm going to be so happy for you. That's kind of where Michigan is, I think, <laughs> in a lot of ways. Right? Because they they are struggling mightily uh, in, in in a lot of ways. That maybe some were foreseen, some were not foreseen. The past game struggles were obvious kind of going in and then they tried to hype us up and say, no, we maybe found some extra things in fall camp and they didn't. Um, But uh, Michigan definitely can stay in this game and they can do what, I mean, because when you look, especially defensively, the majority of those players were guys that were on the field in for big, big stretches in the Rose Bowl and in the national championship game last year, which I'm sure that Michigan beating Washington in the championship game is one reason why uh, Oregon fans uh, are getting along well. I think there is an, uh, there is a level of endearment between our, our two fan bases in uh, that respect. We apologize for not knocking off Ohio State for their last national championship 10 years ago, but... Lo and behold, I, I think Oregon fans appreciate the, uh, the the defeat of Washington. I suspect. I suspect. Yeah. I won't speak for every Oregon fan out there. I'm going to go out on a big crazy limb, Isaiah, and say most Oregon fans are whew, grateful that Washington did not win that game. Yeah, I can I can only imagine. And Michigan fans are likewise very uh, very happy that Oregon beat Ohio State a couple weeks ago. But uh, the the big thing for when you look at what Michigan has from a personnel standpoint, I mean they've got three guys maybe four that are first rounders on the defense alone it's just kind of like little mistakes and they're mostly coming on third down right like you you see them getting big success early and it's kind of more of a coaching thing where they put like uh last week that everyone's kind of complaining and rightfully so about a, a third and 12 that was converted by msu uh where uh, they were able to run right down the middle because Michigan put Mason Graham out on the edge on a third and 12, right? Like they, they're they doing these exotic looks and doing different things on third down and uh, other teams are having great success. Unless it's like a third and one, you, you kind of expect other teams to convert. So you have those mistakes on the defensive side, uh, despite all of the talent. We don't know yet if Will Johnson will be playing. He's missed the last game and a half. Uh, but, uh, I mean, he's one of the guys you've got, like you said, Mason Graham, Kenneth Grant, Josiah Stewart's now in that conversation, the edge rusher. I know Dan Lanning talked about him yesterday. Uh, so they, they've got a lot of talent there. The linebacking core and the safeties are kind of, uh, intermittent, but the, 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 the cornerbacks in the front, very good. 
it's kind of more about what happens on the offensive side and as anemic as Michigan's offensive attack has been, uh, it it's less about the, the ability to score touchdowns as much as it is creating short fields for the opponent, because Michigan has been a turnover machine all year with the exception of Saturday. Saturday was the first time that we saw Michigan not turn the ball over all year long, zero, uh, zero turnovers, zero penalties. Uh, both of those things have really zero happened. penalties in a four quarter football game. Yes. Zero penalties. So that's the first time that Michigan's had either of those things where last year when Michigan was a national championship team, uh, I believe they were uh, la- uh, number one in turnover margin and last in penalties. So uh, that's a big reason why success, because this is a Michigan team that is built where the idea is the offense is going to possess the ball, even if it doesn't score for long stretches and then uh the defense is going to be able to get the be able to quickly get off the field this year it hasn't gone that way because michigan's allowed third down conversions and michigan's offense has turned the ball over with impunity so with that in mind that's why michigan stays in this game but because we've seen it one game doesn't mean that it's a trend that we can expect and yes the passing game has been anemic they just switched back to davis warren jack tuttle just medically retired alex orgy uh, is getting some reps here and there. Uh, but just because it worked well in one game uh, doesn't mean that it's uh, that's a trend. So I, I'm going to be looking to see how that works, uh, especially it, you know, if Oregon looks at Colston Loveland, who is another guy that uh, Dan Landing talked about on Monday. And uh, if Oregon can find a way to take him away from Michigan, then Michigan's going to have a, that much more of an uphill battle. Yeah, and, and one of the reasons I, I feel confident about Oregon in, in this spot is – yeah, Michigan's defense has been really good. I, I don't know that on paper you definitively say it's leaps and bounds ahead of where Ohio State's was. And Oregon, albeit at home, still put up 32 points in that football game and got stopped on a fourth and goal at the three-yard line. And the offense has just been so so multiple and explosive for Oregon this year. It, it's been a refreshing sight to see after the first couple of games where it struggled a bit. There, there, there was some reshuffling along the offensive line. And that unit has settled in in a big way. This is going to be their biggest test. What 100%? This is the best, along with Ohio State defensive line. I I I, th- I think I lean towards Michigan's defensive line over Ohio State's on the interior, and probably go towards Ohio State's guys on the edges because Jack Sawyer and JT Tuomolo are are both just absolute studs. And they were going up against Oregon's best, the NFL offensive tackles that are Johnny Cornelius and Josh Connerly Jr. And Oregon's offensive line won that battle. The interior is where the questions were earlier this season. You have a true sophomore at center in Iapani Lalaulu, or Poncho, as you'll hear him referred to. You've got Marcus Harper, who is a veteran, and you've got Nishad Struther, who uh, is a one-time East Carolina transfer, didn't play a lot last year, but is settled into the starting role uh, this season. That's your guard center guard rotation. And if that unit holds up, then the Oregon offense can move the ball on anyone. I think the way that they have run the ball with Jordan James, the way that they have thrown the ball with Dylan Gabriel, and the way that he has settled into this offense. I talked about this on yesterday's episode of Locked on Ducks. Is Gabriel now doesn't just look better than he did early in the season when he's still acclimating to the new offense. He looks like a guy who has completely settled in and that he is in total control and command Maybe not quite at the Bo Nix level, but still, he and Will Stein, I, I think, have really developed good chemistry, and they're just making a lot of really, really good football plays. So I, I think it comes down to Michigan's defense. Can they hang around? Because I, I do not expect Michigan's offense against this Oregon defense to suddenly be able to put up 20 or more points. So I think if Michigan is going to be able to keep this close, it, it's got to be that kind of classic Big Ten low-scoring slugfest sort of affair because if, if Oregon's offense gets rolling, I, I don't think Michigan has got the horses offensively to keep up. And, you know, yeah, they can run the football really well and have at times this year. I, you can correct me if I'm wrong. I don't think they've been quite as good running the football a, as they were a season ago. But if they can control the clock, keep it low scoring, yes, your defense can can hang around in this game. But like Illinois a week ago, who who Oregon took care of pretty handily, like that that's what this game can look like if Oregon plays to their potential. If you think there are more questions to answer in this matchup, you're right, because there are, and Isaiah and I are going to go uh, back and forth with a little question asking, I still have some questions about Michigan, and we're going to answer those coming up next. 
First, let's talk about game time. A new feature is on game time. It's called game time picks that makes getting tickets to see your favorite teams play live even easier, even Oregon and Michigan, perhaps, or any other college football game you want to go to. Game Time Picks filters out the fluff to show you only incredible deals on great seats so you don't have to waste time searching through thousands of tickets. Curation makes it easier to save more on sports, concerts, comedy, theater, whatever you're looking for. Game Time's got, got it, and they have panoramic views from your seat in the app before you buy so you know exactly what to expect upon arrival. Take the guesswork out of buying tickets with Game Time Picks. Download the Game Time app. Create an account. Use code Locked On College for twenty dollars off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account. Redeem code L O C K E D O N C O L L E G E. That's Locked On College for twenty dollars off. Download Game Time today. Do you know what time it is? I do. It's game time. All right, Isaiah. I've got questions for you about Michigan on behalf of Oregon fans. What has been so wrong with this Michigan passing attack? Well, it's it's multiple fold here. It's um, and that and that that's kind of a loaded question in a lot of ways. Obviously, you look at the quarterback and uh, Davis Warren got the start the first three games, then Alex Orgy the next three, uh, and then uh, you had uh, basically one game with Jack Tuttle as the starter. Uh, and the the turnovers were the biggest issue, I think, overall. But I mean, you've got a mixture of a lot of different things. An unseasoned quarterback that is uh, certainly not really equipped to be able to take uh, take charge of uh, a Michigan offense. Um, you can we'll, we'll see if Davis Warren's up to the task now because obviously he he really kind of played a lot better against Michigan State. Uh, the pass protection with an all new offensive line essentially uh, that's been an issue. There's been injuries on the offensive line. Uh, Michigan won a couple games without Miles Hinton. They've been trying to figure out who their best five is. And some of the players that they expected to kind of come in and and look really good underperformed, right? Like some of these guys like Giovanni Ohati and Jeff Percy have had time on task in the last three years during that stretch. Uh, They've been able to come in and fill in with injuries and looked a lot better than they have so far this year. Uh, But uh, I think one of the big things that you can look at against Michigan State, no sacks given up. That's a first again this year. Uh, so that's been a big part of it. Uh, I think that what's been kind of interesting is just the, the mentality, uh, cause like you said something in segment one that, uh, really kind of struck me because, uh, the, you, like you talk about the run game and, and maybe it's not as good. I think it's been as good, honestly, in a lot of ways, maybe not as dominant, but the problem for Michigan is, uh, from an offensive play calling standpoint, there've been times where it feels like Kurt Campbell, has wanted to really just sling the ball around despite it being the limitation. Uh, that's why I've, I've long advocated for Alex Orgy to, to retain the starting pos- uh, position because I, I understand the second half against USC and second half against Minnesota didn't look that great. Uh, but because Michigan had like kind of the constraints of we need to mostly run the ball and it looked really good doing so in the first half, uh, they, they had, had commanding leads going into the second half in both of those games, right? So, um, but, but when they, when they've gone with some of these other quarterbacks or even Alex Orgy at the start of the Washington game, inexplicably, they, they came out trying to pass the ball, like right out the gates as if they were a passing first team. And, uh, we've seen, uh, all three, well, really two of the three quarterbacks attempt more passes than even JJ McCarthy did per on a per game basis last year when you know you had a former five star who is more well equipped to being able that's to go out jar- there. I, I sorry to cut you off but like that's jarring for me to hear when you are clearly e- even if you no, no matter how you sliced it before the season you were downgrading at the quarterback spot because none mm-hmm. of those guys are going to be you know early first round picks that that's shocking i i think for myself and a lot of oregon fans to hear that michigan is not you know, running the ball 45 times a game and throwing it 10. I mean, J.J. McCarthy, didn't he have a game last year where he attempted like 12 passes? Eight. Uh, he was seven for eight against eight. Penn State. They realized that uh, they weren't going to be able to pass on Penn State, so they ran 32 straight times in the Penn State game. So they that is kind of what they did with Alex Orgy in the USC and Minnesota games. And then they go up against Washington, and or the like right out the gates, they're trying to throw the football and uh, it didn't work out, and Washington went up 14 nothing, and they made the switch to Jack Tuttle, continued throwing the ball, and uh, ultimately it was a, a fumble and a turnover, uh, or an interception, rather, two turnovers that changed the calculus of that game. 
So uh, it, it is kind of perplexing because the, I'd long said exactly what you just said is Michigan needs to essentially run the ball 40 times and pass it like 10 or 15 times. And with orgy, that's exactly what they were doing. And it kind of doesn't matter if it's orgy or not. The reason why I kind of liked the Alex orgy package or uh, not package, but him as the starter was because it kind of forced the hand of Kurt Campbell, the offensive coordinator, uh, because even when he's called really incredible plays and really creative plays, which he's done every week, I mean, he's had some really boneheaded, questionable play calls uh, from time to time. But there's a lot of times where you look at what he's doing and what he's trying to do, even in the passing game, and you say, that was really smart. And he really schemed a guy open. But the, the problem is, is either you had a quarterback who couldn't deliver in, on that execution or a wide receiver, who because you have to keep in mind, Michigan also lost its two starting wide receivers from last year and Cornelius Johnson and Roman Wilson. And they, they did not have anyone with any kind of sizable production uh, going in. They also uh, have been really reticent to use uh, some of the options at their disposal. There have been games where Colston Loveland hasn't been targeted as much as you would expect. Now, they've most of the time they're going to the well about seven or eight times, but there's been a couple of games where you've only seen them really go to Colston uh, four times or so. Uh, Donovan Edwards still not really being utilized in the past game. Uh, despite the fact that we've seen that he can be a really suitable wide receiver type or at least a pass-catching threat out of the backfield, uh, I go back to his uh, his freshman year where he had 170 receiving yards against Maryland. Uh, but yet, uh, it, you know, despite them saying going into the next year, 2022, that he was probably the best receiver they had on the entire team, we haven't really seen them try to use him like that. He's underperforming even what he did in terms of receiving each of the last uh, three years. So uh, that's kind of been surprising. It just feels like they have options at their disposal that they don't really use. Now, this last week against MSU, they were more creative and used the personnel in a way that more suited what they have. And if that's an, like a kind of a harbinger of what could come this, this week, then maybe you can throw out the script a little bit and say, okay, maybe we just haven't seen Michigan really going and using what it has the way it should, and now it's figured it out, and now it can move the ball a little bit better. Like I said before, though, it just one game isn't really a trend, so it's hard to really see and understand. But against MSU, near the end of the first half, when they were down 7 nothing and really couldn't move the ball at all, finally you started seeing them putting their players in a position to succeed and executing, and that's how they were able to take a 9-7 halftime lead, go up and uh, and make that score 24-10 to and uh, be able to hold on. So it'll be interesting to see if they've learned from their mistakes finally. Because that's been a big thing is it's been kind of a little bit of everything. It's been a lack of execution. It's been bad coaching. It's been turnovers. It's been new players trying to get acclimated to their roles. And we, we saw kind of a confluence of that working on the offensive side. But there's still a lot of issues defensively that have allowed teams to stay in it. Because for whatever reason, the defense might pitch a gem one game. And then the next game, a team can pass on you. Next game, team can run on you, but they can't pass. Right, because you see, we look at Illinois. Illinois only passed for 80 yards on Michigan, uh, but they were able to run the ball early in the year. Other teams couldn't really run the ball on Michigan whatsoever, but they could pass. You kind of just don't know what you're going to get on a game by game basis from this team. Like uh, a box of chocolates. Other, yeah, pretty much. You never know what you're going to get. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, I want to ask a question about the defensive side as well, and then we'll we'll flip roles here in the final segment. But as I said earlier, if Michigan's going to hang around or pull the upset here. Uh, of Oregon with the way they've been playing in the last few weeks it's got to stay low scoring I just haven't seen any evidence from Michigan's offense or Oregon's defense that the Wolverines could even get to the 24 to 27 point range with the way Oregon's playing on that side of the ball whether Jordan Birch is available or not what is your confidence level and, and maybe a key or two to Michigan's defense holding Oregon to their lowest point total of the year I, I think they'd have to keep them around 20. Um I, I I don't necessarily have a high confidence level, right? Like I would predict uh, Oregon to basically match the spread at least uh, 14 and a half. I believe it is at this point on FanDuel. Yep. Uh, but it's at the same time, it, it's kind of more like, okay, that's more of a coaching thing than it is a, uh, a personnel thing. I mean, they do have some personnel issues. Zeke Berry, the nickelback has regressed significantly. Is Will Johnson able to go? Because Amir Hall is obviously a big downgrade from Will Johnson. Can take away a whole side of the field. Will Johnson's the the all time Michigan leader in pick sixes as well. He's got two on the season uh, so far. 
So uh, if, if he's able to go, then that can kind of change things. I mean, we've seen Dylan Gabriel have some moments where he's made some uh, errant throws. It's rare, but it's happened. Obviously, we've seen him turn the ball over. So that's kind of what Michigan needs is to be able to capitalize on those things. And um, and it, it's it's going to just take a lot of these guys that have played good games playing their best game. Really, they, they that that's. I mean, that's usually what you see in any big matchup, right? It's mostly, it's usually not going to be like, well, they didn't play their best game and they still won. I mean, that does happen. Oregon didn't play its best game against Ohio State and it still won. Felt like there was a lot of, you know, a lot of uh, meat left on the bone in, in that matchup. But uh, for, for a team like Michigan, that's to be able to upend it, uh, upend Oregon in this game, it, it's going to require some of these guys that have shown that they can be really good. Jair Hill, who's been, had his moments of looking really good, but looked really, really bad in the first uh, several games of the season. You look at the Texas game, Texas was targeting him directly. And, but by, by the time that USC came to town, he suddenly was a much better player, but then he regressed against Washington. So uh, it's going to take the defense kind of playing up to his strengths. And part of that is the linebacking core, which has really surprised me uh, with how not good it's been. Ernest Hausman was the top linebacker in the portal a couple of years ago. Uh, he had to sit behind uh, Junior Colson and Mike Barrett last year, and uh, it, it expected him to be kind of an All-American type. And he's he's been okay, but he hasn't been a disaster. But it's been kind of shocking at how kind of reactive he's been. But uh, to more even more so, uh, Jay Sean Barham, the transfer from Maryland, uh, they spoke about him as being a guy that would they thought internally was going to be a first round draft pick, and. He's been mostly abysmal this year. He's had some moments, but he's been out of position. It's kind of one of those things where he's so freakishly athletic that he runs himself out of plays. He hasn't shown very good instincts a lot of the time this year. So that's been a real big problem for them in terms of defense. And then you look at the safety position, it's been kind of the same. I, you go into the season, they were uh, the safeties were my top position for the entire team. Uh, it was just looking so deep, uh, even with Rod Moore being – out for the majority of the season after tearing his ACL in the spring game. Uh, you look at uh, Makari Page, who's been a starter the last three years. Uh, you look at uh, Quentin Johnson, who was a pivotal role player for, for Michigan. I mean, Quentin's been very good. Makari's regressed significantly. And then they brought in Jaden Mangum, who we haven't seen outside of game one, and uh, Wesley Walker, who got burned a few times against MSU. It's it's gotten to be a very thin group, and it hasn't really played up to its potential. So, if Michigan defensively, it's got it's got guys who have performed at a high level. You you look at some of these names I said; they've played incredible in the Rose Bowl and against Washington in the national championship game. But then in some of these games, they've regressed. And Dale, they're running the system that they've run. Uh, the last two defensive coordinators for Michigan were acolytes of Wink Martindale under him at the Baltimore Ravens. But Wink comes in, not really acclimated to the college game, kind of doing some things that might work in the NFL. The cue of, hey, I've got to humble myself a little bit and understand that some of these things aren't going to work in the college game because it is a different style of game. So he hasn't necessarily called the greatest games. Some of the personnel uh, groupings that they've had have been questionable at best. Uh, so it's going to take also – uh, some introspection from Wink Martindale to take a look at what he has, say, this is the best way we can beat Oregon. And if this doesn't work, we need to go back to the types of things that have worked with this personnel grouping uh, in the past. We still got one more segment to get to. Isaiah is going to ask me what questions Michigan has to answer for Oregon on that side of things. And that is coming up next. All right, wrapping up our Locked On crossover show. That's Isaiah Hole of Locked On Wolverines. I'm Spencer McLaughlin, Locked On Ducks. Isaiah, I am a blank canvas. Ask away. All right. Well, uh, like I mentioned, Dylan Gabriel. Well, you mentioned Dylan Gabriel being uh, very, uh, like he's settled in. He's figured things out. He's looked a lot sharper. Now, I went into the season with Oregon, my preseason Big Ten champion. So I was kind of surprised to see some of the struggles early in the season. What was he struggling with earlier? Where has he gotten better? And what would you still like to see him improve upon and going into a game like this? I think trust is the biggest difference between him now versus him week one. I, I think in that Idaho game, which I described at the time and stand by as the worst Dan Lanning team performance in his tenure. That includes a 49-3 to loss to Georgia, losing three straight times to Washington by three points. Like 
that that game was the worst four quarters of football Oregon's played. And, you know, they had to battle at the end. They had to convert a late fourth down against Idaho uh, to win the game at home. It was an inauspicious start to the year, but this is a much different football team. And Gabriel is much different from then. The trust he has with his offensive line, I think, is substantial. If you look at the numbers from that game, Dylan Gabriel was 41 of 49. Could not run the football against Idaho. 2.9 yards of carry. Alik Terry, the offensive line coach, uh, made a shirt that he wore at practice all next week going into Boise State that said 2.9 yards of carry, Idaho. Uh, to kind of you know jar his offensive line guys into into high gear, and they've been much much better uh, since then. But for Gabriel, I, I think it's trust in his offensive line and trust in his offensive coordinator. You know, he he wanted in that Idaho game to get the ball out of his hands really quickly. It was 41 completions for 380 yards. Now 380, two touchdowns, no picks. If you just said that, well, that's fine. But when you watch the game. It was four yards here, three yards here, two yards there, seven yards there. Hey, look, 10 yards. Ah, here's five. It was a lot of stuff before the line or before the first down line. And now when you watch this Oregon offense, like Ohio State was, I think, the best example of it. If you if you press up and say, hey, we want to take away Oregon's RPO game, we don't want to allow Dylan Gabriel to get into a quick hitting rhythm, he'll say, okay, Evan Stewart's going over the top. We're sending Tez Johnson deep. Or, you know, they've had some, they've been better in the screen game with guys like Kenyon Sadiq at tight end. Uh, Terrence Ferguson, Patrick Herbert as well in that room have been productive. But I, I think that's the biggest difference is they're creating explosive plays and there is a trust between quarterback, offensive coordinator, and offensive line that wasn't there in the first two weeks consistently enough now it is and they they seem to have really unlocked the full potential of this offense i really only have one other question for you uh because yeah. I, I think we've plowed a lot of ground uh for it, throughout this whole show but uh obviously michigan is a sizable underdog this is the biggest uh that they've been an underdog at home but what are your actual concerns for oregon going into this game if if this does end up being an upset in one way or another. Uh, obviously, it's going to take Michigan playing up to its strengths, but it would also take Oregon playing into its own weaknesses, most likely. What are those weaknesses, and what, in your eyes, would equate to it being a little bit more of a nail-biter from uh, Oregon's side? I, I think the two things that jump out as my biggest concerns are this is the toughest road game Oregon has played so far this season. Because the last time they were on the road, they played Purdue. You've watched Purdue this season as well. That's not a good football team. They played Oregon State on the road back for their third game of the season. And Oregon State is decent-ish. If they played Michigan right now, I, I would take Michigan in that football game because they just have more talent across the board. And Oregon State is unfortunately a Mountain West adjacent school at this point that, that's kind of in a rebuild season. And when you look at the other games that Oregon has played, I think this is one of their tougher games, but when you factor in that they're on the road, I, I just wonder how they respond if Michigan's able to throw an early counterpunch. Like Dylan Gabriel hasn't thrown interceptions in a big spot with a team that is poised to respond. Like he threw two red zone interceptions against Michigan State. He threw one against UCLA. He threw one against Illinois last week. None of those interceptions really worried me in the moment it worried me with regards to is he going to be able to protect the football because once ohio state comes into town you can't do that stuff well then he protected the ball against ohio state oregon wins the football game but the interception against ucla they took it to the house and it went from a 28 to 3 game to 28 to 10 and oregon you know was steamrolling the bruins michigan state that game never felt close it, it, it never felt like Michigan State had one drive. They went down are, the field. That, are you sure? Because Michigan State fans seem to feel like, <laughs> you know, they were right in that thing, you know? Yeah. Jordan James went for 150 yards rushing in the first half and, and had Oregon fans thinking about Kenyon Barner against USC in 2012 when he went for 324 and five touchdowns. That's what we were looking up at the half is like, hey, what's the record for rushing yards in a game? Like, everything did start to click in Big Ten play a, a, against Michigan State there, but like, after Aiden Childs fumbled on the two yard line, I, I I was just watching, thinking I don't think they're going to score another touchdown or, or a touchdown. I, and they ended up getting one on the second string defense. Like Oregon's defense just played exceptionally well. So I, I getting away from the point that I was making here, the interception against Illinois last week, the game was already over. Like I came on the show and was upset with the coaching staff. Like you're up thirty five to nine 
early in the fourth quarter? Why are you taking a deep shot after you just ran it twice to pick up a first down? Run the ball, drain the clock, go home, get ready for Michigan next week. Like the game was already over at that point. So Gabriel has not thrown a consequential interception that I felt was going to impact a game that could be close. So if that happens early, I wonder how Oregon responds. The second thing, interior of the offensive line. That, like I said, they, they you know played chess with it a little bit and moved them around early in the season. They found the combination. They have run the ball well. I won't say great, but they have run it effectively enough to allow for play action, keep the defense honest. They've been really good in pass protection. Does that continue here? Because the offense was not the same, like most offenses, when your quarterback was getting sacked seven times in the first two games against Idaho and Boise State. So I don't have questions about Oregon's tackles. Those guys are going to go play on Sunday after this season. But on the interior, they they have been solid. But I I have more questions there against this Michigan interior. I I think that's the key matchup for for Oregon's offense in this game. So uh, those would be my my two biggest my two biggest concerns. I don't think we're doing predictions this early in in the week. I, I don't have one loaded on the top of my head. That's all right. Uh, I mean, I'll tell you, I expect Oregon to win this game, uh, like I said, by about the spread. So unless Michigan gets some answers somehow, and uh, I mean, Davis Warren, if he has another game like he did against Arkansas State, except for the interceptions, yeah, he compl- he went, he actually completed all 14 of his pass attempts against Arkansas State in week three. It's just that three of them went to the other team. If Davis Warren can find a way to, to be efficient, and Michigan can extend drives and be complimentary, actually get off the field on third down, then then we'll see. But it, they haven't done it all year, so it, it's kind of hard for me to say anything other than an Oregon sizable victory at this point. And, and one thing that I'll, I'll leave you with is Oregon defensively feels like they're playing better and better every week. They pitched their first shutout against Purdue on the road. That was the first shutout Oregon's had in 12 years. They – gave up one touchdown to Illinois and that one touchdown was a result of a 15 yard penalty on third and nine where Derek Harmon threw a running back to the ground after the play was over. He doesn't do that. Illinois maybe only has uh, three points uh, in, in last week's game. So I, I feel really good about Oregon's defense. Will Howard's the only guy to eclipse 200 yards passing against this Oregon defense so far this season. Everyone else has come up short. I don't expect that to change this week. So I think it comes down to that Michigan rushing attack. Can they carry the load enough, get 14 to 17 points, and then can the defense uh, do what, what no one's been able to do in recent weeks against Oregon? And that's that's slowing down. Isaiah Hole, Locked On Wolverines. I'm Spencer McLaughlin, Locked On Ducks. This has been a Locked On College crossover. We appreciate you listening. We'll see you next time. And until then, hope you have a wonderful rest of your day.